as Bishop said, I've been praying and I asked God that he would bring me into the grace that exists on this moment. Because I do believe that whenever we gather together that there is a strategic assignment from God. There is a grace on this moment and I don't think that you're here by coincidence. I don't think you're logged in by accident. I believe that God has a word with you in mind. I believe that I was, as I was praying that he had your house in mind and I cannot wait to get into this word. I'm gonna be speaking from not an unfamiliar text, but it's gonna be John, John 2. And my text begins in scripture four, so John two and four. I prayed, hey family, look at y'all back there. I have not seen the family in forever. I've been praying that God would give me something just for you. If that's yours, I want you to just raise your hands as if you're receiving it already, as if you're reaching up into the heavens and grabbing down that word that God has for you. And I believe that there's going to be a special grace, not just on the households represented here, but for every house that's watching online. I'm in John 2, verse 4. And for those of you who like to take notes, my subject is the end of an era the end of an era. When I begin this in verse four, Jesus is at a wedding at Cana. He's there with his mother, Mary. In the chapter just before, we see that Jesus has been baptized. He has recruited his disciples and yet he has not officially begun his ministry yet. And here he is at this wedding at Canaan. As I was praying, God revealed some things to me that I wanted to share with you. Verse four begins, and it's Mary has come up to Jesus and let him know that they have run out of wine at the wedding. And Jesus' response to Mary was so intriguing that I felt like I wanted to highlight it for today. Verse four says, Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Spirit of the living God, you gave me this word with your people in mind. And so Father, I ask that you would bring me into alignment with what heaven already knows. That you would allow this to be a moment where you sit with your people, Father. Your word, your spirit is not limited by distance. It is not limited by walls, Father. But if you speak a word, we know that it can permeate the earth. So I speak power flowing in Africa. I speak power flowing in the UK. I speak power in Mississippi, power in Canada, because it is the same power that reaches all of us that resurrected Jesus from the dead. Let your power fall, Father. And as your power falls, Father, I pray that there would be none of me and only you. This would be a moment of pure glory, Father. Let it rest over our house, let it rest over our bodies, let it rest over our mind, and may it change who we are. Because when your spirit shows up, there is no way we can stay the same. So let your transformational power fall in this place, great God that you are. Have your way, in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. If you're watching online, I want you to type amen in the comments, amen in the comments. You're gonna be the amen corner in the chat room. You know, I think the world all took a collective pause on January 28th 
when news of Cicely Tyson's passing began to hit our phones and television. Can I tell you, I don't know if it's because I've just been so used to seeing her throughout my life that there was a part of me that thought, even naively, that I would always be able to access that essence, that excellence. In many ways, her death marked the end of an era. There are these moments that happen in life that we know without a shadow of a doubt are the end of an era. It has to be how the people who were living in the 20s felt when the Great Depression came, coming right after the heels of the Roaring Twenties. They had to know when in that Great Depression that there is no way that we'll ever be able to access that essence or excellence. Again, there are some ends of an era that mark us forever. Maybe that's how people felt when bell bottoms went out of style. Will anyone ever fully appreciate bell bottoms again? It was an end of an era or how jazz lovers felt when rock and roll took its ascent. It was the end of an era and ends of an era feel so sad because you can no longer access it. And yet, not all ends of eras are sad. If you don't believe me, ask the person retiring after 30, 40 years on a job. Or ask the adult who's moving out of their parents' house, this is an end of an era, and yet there is an excitement connected to it because though it is an end, it is also the backdrop in which a beginning can emerge. It is a beautiful end of an era. I don't think there is an end of an era more beautiful though than what takes place at a wedding. At a wedding, your single life has come to an end. It is the end of an era, but this new married life is beginning. And so there is an excitement about what is to come. This wedding at Cana, it is the end of an era. These two people, we don't even know who they are. The text doesn't go into that detail, but we know that they are celebrating the end of an era so that a new era can begin. And yet it's not just their end of an era either. You see, it would take a little bit of digging and some comparison to the synoptic gospels to understand that this is also an end of an era for Jesus. You know, in Luke 2, we see very little about Jesus' childhood, and yet it tells us so much about how he spent the years before his ministry began. We know when he was born. We know about him being in the manger. We don't know when Jesus took his first step. We don't know when he said his first word. As a matter of fact, we know very little about Jesus growing up, and yet there is this one instance that is sandwiched within the synoptic gospels that literally doesn't quite fit because we know so little about him, but we hear about a 12-year-old boy Jesus. This 12-year-old boy Jesus, nothing before it, nothing after it, but this 12-year-old boy Jesus is headed to Jerusalem with his parents for the Passover. And when they get ready to go back to Nazareth, they look amongst the crowd and Jesus isn't there. Why? Why, why is this story placed in Luke 2? Why do we need to understand this about boy Jesus? And I think that as I was studying, I, I preached a message called Now Won't Let Go. I preached a message about what it must have been like to be Jesus at 12 years old with a revelation about who he is. Because at 12 years old, when his parents are headed back to Nazareth, they look amongst the crowd and realize Jesus is not there. And they go back to Jerusalem and they find Jesus at the temple, sitting amongst the priests. 
sitting in an, in an environment that reflects what God has placed down on the inside of him. You see, there's something special about finally finding someone who sounds just a little bit like what God said to you. You sound just a little bit like what God, so much so that I'm willing to separate myself from where I was and separate my, some people are logged in right now because you sound like what God is doing down on the inside of me. I'm not logged in because it's convenient. I'm not logged in because I don't have anything else to do. I'm logged in because you sound like what God is doing down on the inside of me. I separated myself from the rhythm of the house because you sound like what God is doing down on the inside of me. And Jesus pulls away from what is known because he's looking for a sound. He finds that sound in the temple. So much so that he can't even go with the flow anymore. And here come Mary and Joseph. When you finally found your sound, when you finally found something that looks like what God wants to do on the inside of you, have you ever had the old pulling you back to who you used to be? Jesus said, I finally found my spot. This sounds like what God placed down on the inside of me. And here come Mary and Joseph looking for him, trying to make him go back to where he needed to be. If I would have said what Jesus said to Mary and Joseph, to Bishop and First Lady Jakes, I wouldn't even be alive to preach to you right now. Jesus said, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know I would be about my father's business? I can't imagine it. All of my teeth would be gone. And yet Jesus says this to Mary and Joseph because he is so frustrated because the reality of now does not match the revelation of what God has placed down on the inside of him. Have you ever been frustrated with now? Now, now you don't look like what God said. Now you told me my child was gonna make it. Now you told me I was gonna get that degree. How come now doesn't look like what God said? And it would be one thing if I didn't know what God placed down on the inside of me, but I know that now is not matching what he said. And now, now won't let me go. Now won't let me move into the next dimension. Now won't let me move into that job. I can't move into that city. The finances aren't adding up. I don't have the connection sometimes now won't let you go and so Luke 2 tells me that Jesus subjected himself to Mary and Joseph because sometimes the only way to survive now is to become obedient to now God if you won't let me move then let me become obedient to now, who am I supposed to be? If I can't operate in what you told me I'm supposed to operate in, help me to become obedient to what now was trying to teach me. Have you ever had to subject yourself to now? Maybe that's the breakthrough you're looking for. Some of us are praying for the breakthrough to get to the next dimension and I hear God saying, what you need to be praying for is the ability to surrender to now, to subject yourself to what now was trying to teach you, to subject yourself to what now has in store for you. Sometimes you gotta surrender to what this moment is trying to teach you. I wish I could get over this grief, but I gotta surrender to what grief is trying to teach me. I wish I could move over into that next situation, but I gotta surrender to what singleness is trying to teach me. I wish I had this, I wish I had that. The seduction of next is ringing in my mind, and yet the only thing I can do is surrender to what now is trying to teach me. I hear God saying there's another level of surrender that he wants to see. I hear God saying that there's another level of subjection that he wants you to see, and when you surrender to now, now like Jesus had to do. It's not always easy. But in the process of that, Luke 2 tells me that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You see, we don't want to surrender to now because we think we're gonna lose something if we surrender to now. And yet this, this story in the middle of Luke 2 that really doesn't even make any sense shows me that when I surrender to now, I can still increase. There is no sacrifice when I surrender to now. The only thing that now can do is teach me how to increase in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This situation doesn't even look like it could benefit what God 
place down on the inside of Jesus. And yet in his surrendering, there was increase connected to it. I wish I could say it the way I sense it. But I need someone to understand that when you surrender to now, you don't lose next. When you surrender to now, you don't diminish. When you surrender to now, you don't decrease. God says surrender is the only way to increase. I know what the culture says. I know what they say on social media, that if you get pulled back, you can't go forward. But I hear God saying for my people, the only way that they can go forward is if they're willing to get on a cross and surrender to now. If they're willing to be held back every now and then. If they're willing to surrender to my pace and not their own. Because the truth is, God's anointed can be held back forever. You can't be held back forever. Somebody's got to let grief know. I can't be held back forever. I may be held back for a minute, but I can't be held back forever. I'm going to surrender to what this moment is teaching me, but I can't be held back forever because I know who I am in God. And God didn't put it down on the inside of me for it to die on the inside of me. I may be held back for a moment, but I trust who's holding me back. It's not my promotion to have right now. It's not my house to have right now. It don't mean I'm not gonna ever have it, it just means I can't have it now. And what I'm gonna do with now is gonna prepare me for next. So when we find Jesus in John 2, it is the end of an era. Because I no longer have to be held back anymore. From 12 to 30, we don't know what happened to Jesus, but we know that this was his first sign, the beginning of his ministry, which means he spent 18 years held back. That's somebody's word right now. You can be held back for 18 minutes, but do you have 18 years in you? You can be held back for a moment, but do you have some years for it? Somebody's been held back for years, and they've been thinking they'll never get released. But I hear God saying that this is the end of an era. I hear God saying, don't give up right now, that this is an end of an era and we about to see Jesus in the era of being held back is this your word I want you to reach up and grab it we're about to see Jesus in the era of being held back I don't know who you are but this is hitting you down in your spirit because you feel like this is the end of the era of me being held back this is the end of the era of me feeling like I don't have my child me feeling like I'm going to lose my mind I hear God saying this is the end of an era this is the end of an era this is your word and I feel God on it Jesus in John 2 is getting ready to be released into his ministry. He's been held back, but the time is over. And as I told you why he was held back, he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. The evidence of that increase is not just in how he gathered the disciples. You see, because he was preparing for the moment in which he would no longer be held back. Jesus got the disciples before he performed the miracle. Because just because I'm held back doesn't mean I'm not preparing for when I'm no longer held back. I may be held back right now, but I want to be prepared for the moment it's time for me to step into it. That means I got to have the right circle. That means I got to have the right anointing. That means I got to have the right environment. Why? I know it doesn't make sense to you now because I'm not there yet, but there's going to be a moment when I step into it. And when I step into it, I don't want there to be any doubt that I wasn't prepared. I've been praying. I've been studying. I've been reading books about business. I haven't started the business yet, but it's going to come. I've been being mentored by people who don't even know my name because there's going to be a moment when I step into it. Are you prepared for the moment when you are no longer held back? It's what you do with the time that makes the difference. It's not just being held back. It's about preparing for the moment when I am released. It's about preparing for the moment when the husband comes. It's about preparing for the moment when the loan does come through. Do you have your credit together? Do you have your finances backed up? You're held back but are you prepared for the moment when you get released? And Jesus is preparing because I'm going to be released one day. 
I'm waiting for the moment when God says, go do that thing. I'm waiting for the moment when God says, you got this. I'm waiting for the moment when God says, step into it. I got to have the right people with me. I got to have the right heart posture. I got to have the right spirit. I got to let the Holy Spirit fall on me because I don't want to get there and have the trauma from the generations with me. I want to be healed when I get there. I want to be whole when I get there. I want to have empathy when I get there. And the evidence of his preparation is not just in who he collected. It's in how his perspective changed about his anointing. <laughs> because his perspective shifted in such a way that he's no longer the 12 year old boy looking to connect with his anointing. He's looking to protect his anointing, you see? Connection is what we need when we're desperate to be affirmed. Protection is when you recognize who you are. So I can't just connect to anybody anymore. That's why the ministry couldn't start it at 12. Because if it would have started at 12, he would have been friends with the very temple he was meant to tear down. That's why he had to wait to be increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You see, you'll settle too low right now if I connect you. You gotta come to a place where you're willing to protect it over connection. When you're raising children, you understand this well. Because sometimes I gotta protect you before I can connect connect with you. I got to protect what God is doing down on the inside of me. I can't just connect with anybody. And Jesus has shifted in such a way that it is more important to him to protect his anointing. My hour hasn't come yet. I got to protect what God is doing. Mama, I know you got a problem, but I got to protect what God is doing for me. I'm not looking to just pour this anointing out anywhere. I got to protect it so it's effective. I got to protect it so it can do what God has called it to do. No, I can't just go anywhere. No, I just can't connect with anyone anymore. That was 12 year old me. That was a lesser version of who I was. The anointing was there, but I was too desperate for affirmation. I had to come to a place where I understood who I am. And when you understand who you are, you're more willing to protect it than connect with it. That's why I can be by myself because I'm willing to protect it more than I am willing to be connected. That's why I'll keep the, in, the idea inside of me because I'm willing to protect it more than I'm willing to just connect it with anything that passes by. Jesus has come to a place where protection is more important to him than connection. You know, I used to believe that when Mary tells Jesus that they've run out of wine, that he was being asked to perform a miracle. But if we're honest, there's really nothing in the text that suggests that she was doing anything other than stating a fact. We've just run out of wine. I think there was something about the way Jesus responded that let Mary know that he's ready to walk into it. God help me. When the problem starts irritating your anointing, <laughs> when what I used to accept is just a fact, now begins to irritate my anointing. I feel like there's something in me that should respond to the problem that is in front of me. Oh God. There have been some problems that have been presented in your life. They've been presented as just facts. And you've been trying to just take it. And you've been trying to just accept it as fact, but you can't do it because it's irritating your anointing. I should just accept the fact that my latter days are not going to be greater. I should just accept the fact that that child is going to be a problem child. But every time I try to accept it, it irritates my anointing. It makes me feel like it's a problem for my spirit. Mary just stated a fact, but God said, you're trying to vex my anointing. And Mary knew that 
that if it's vexing your anointing, then this is a problem that only you can solve. I tell Mary, as she was studying this text, I saw that she told him do whatever he says because he's ready to step into it in a way he could have never stepped into it unless it vexed his anointing. God help me. What have you been accepting as fact that has been vexing your anointing? Because I hear God saying that this is the end of an era for that problem. That problem is coming to an end. Mary presents a problem. And the only reason why that problem comes to an end is because of how it pulls on Jesus' anointing. She didn't say Jesus performed the miracle, but Jesus' response says, woman, what does it have to do with me? My hour hasn't come. I, I didn't think it had anything to do with you, but now that you've responded in that way, it makes me feel like maybe quite possibly this is a problem that only your anointing can solve. Jesus is waiting for an hour. He doesn't realize that the hour is coming as a problem. Most people miss their moment because they don't realize that their moment is disguised as a problem. And the moment that he realizes that this moment is disguised as a problem, my hour is disguised as a problem, he can step into it. Your hour of breakthrough is not coming when everything looks good. It's not coming when everything is pretty. It's not coming when everything has lined up and you're ready to step into it. The hour is coming when you recognize that I gotta take authority over a problem. And when I take authority over that a problem, that I'm not just gonna do it by stepping into it is me. I'm going to do it by stepping into who God called me to be. I hear God saying the hour of you sitting back and acting like you don't have the Holy Ghost, that you don't have the power, that you don't have the anointing is over. I hear God saying that I called you into this wedding because it is the end of an era, not just for the married people, but it is the end of an era for a version of you that is less than who God has called you to be. I hear God saying you been on the sideline long enough. It's time for you to walk into it in a fresh new way. This is it. This is the end. This is the end you've been waiting for. This is the breakthrough you've been waiting for. We don't need to wait until the pandemic is over. We don't need to wait until the child gets out of jail. We don't need to wait until the problem is bigger than us. I hear God saying that it can end right now if you dig down to who I've called you to be. Mary says to Jesus, he says to the servants, do whatever, do whatever he says. This is the moment that we see Jesus finally become who he always knew he was destined to become. On the backdrop of a wedding, the ultimate bridegroom takes his position. This is the moment. It's disguised as a problem, but this is a moment. I want you to get your problem in your mind. I want you to get that issue that's plaguing you in your mind. That's your moment. Your moment isn't in the bank account. Your moment isn't in another check. It's in the problem. It's in the problem. It's in the problem. It's in the problem. The breakthrough is in the problem. The anointing is in the problem. The miracle is in the problem. What is a miracle if there is no problem? What is a breakthrough if there is no breakdown? I hear God saying you're underestimating the problem. And Jesus takes authority over the problem because if he doesn't, the problem will take authority over his environment. And I want you to know something. 
that the celebration is not going to end, that the breakthrough is not going to end because God has told Jesus to take authority over the problem. And I hear God saying that you've been allowing a problem to take authority over your household. You've been allowing a problem to take authority over your mind. And I hear God saying that you got enough power if you would tap into Jesus that would allow you to take authority over that problem. You know what it was also the end of? It was the end of the era for death. It was the end of the era for sin. It was the end of the era for you missing the mark. It was the end of the era for any limitation that would ever stand in your way. It was not just the end of the era for Jesus walking into his destiny, but hell will serve notice in this moment that the king is here that the king is here, 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 the king is here. Demons started trembling when water turned into wine because they recognized that it was the end of an era. Demons for cancer got nervous when he turned water into wine because it was an end of an era. God said, I got an end coming and it may take me a few years and there'll be 400 years of silence for my people. But when I finally open my mouth, I'm going to bring the Messiah in and he's going to come in on a manger and it's going to be the end of an era and 2,000 years later you still have access to the end hmm. you still have access to that power that causes problems, that causes suicide, that causes depression to end. And maybe you've been letting it irritate you, but you haven't taken authority over it. Who would you be if you took authority over the problem that's taken authority over your marriage? you took authority over the issues that taken authority over your mind it's not bigger than you sir it's not bigger than you sis it's not greater than you and there were just a few things that Jesus did in that moment when he stepped into it and if you will allow me I want to suggest that you do the very same thing he took, he accepted authority. Mary said, whatever he says to do, do it. He accepted that I got authority over this thing. Oh, I feel something on that. Oh, I feel something on that. That feel like something old school. I accept that I got authority over this thing. I accept that I got authority over disease. I accept that I got authority over this church. I got authority over this ministry. I got authority over this child. I hear God saying you need to reach up and grab your authority. That you need to reach up and grab that power. That that same Jesus that was raised from the dead did so that you could have authority over that situation. Then he did something else. She said, whatever he says, do it. He started opening his mouth. It's one thing to have authority. It's another thing to open your mouth and use that authority that God gave you. God said, if you open your mouth, I'll fill your mouth. You won't open your mouth because you don't know what you're going to say. But I hear God saying, if you open your mouth, I'll give you the words when you get there. I don't even have to go back in my Bible to prove that. Because somebody ought to know about Moses who didn't want to open his mouth. And God said, if you would just give me your mouth, I'll give you the words when you get there. Somebody needs to start speaking over that problem. You need to start speaking over that situation. I shall live and not die. Not in my house. Not in my marriage, not in my finances, not in my home, not in my body. <laughs> then he opens his mouth and he doesn't have to look for anything to solve the problem. Because everything he needed to fix the problem 
was already in the environment. That's what happens when you don't take authority over the problem. When you don't take authority over the problem, you cannot see a solution. But when you take authority over the problem, you see how all of the components are already within reach. He says, take six water pots. I, I don't even need you to go and find water pots for this miracle. I hear God saying, you already know everybody you need to know. I hear God saying, you already have all the finances you need. You don't need another check. You don't need another mentor. You don't need anyone else to come from anywhere else. You already got what you need. God was just waiting for you to take authority so that you could see what you have properly. Now that I understand the problem, and now that I've taken authority over the problem, now I can see how to use this and that to fix it. I see the miracle is already in me reach. The miracle is already at your house. I'm glad you're watching at home because your water pots are at your house. I'm glad you're walking from your house because the miracle is already under your roof. I hear God saying, I already know where you live. I already know how to get it to you. <laughs> The strategy is already there. <laughs> what I found most interesting about this moment is that Jesus doesn't ask the servants, can I taste that wine before you take it to him? Because, listen, there's a part of me that would have did all of them steps. But before we send it on out there, before I release it, can I taste it to make sure that I did what God told me to do? But Jesus trusted what God gave him. And when you trust what God gives you, you don't have time to compare it to what you've tasted before. You don't have time to judge it before you release it. You trust that because God gave it to me, that it is exactly what it is supposed to be. I told God, I don't know what the word is. I don't know how it's gonna roll out of my tongue, but I trust what you gave me. I hear God saying that somebody's gotta trust what I gave you. You gotta trust that I installed it. I pre-installed the necessary, com the necessary components is for the breakthrough before you even needed it. Trust. Trust what I gave you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of an era if ever there was one. As I stand in this church, in a pandemic, with masks, in a Zoom audience. It is evidence that an end of some type of era has come. And yet, God is still moving. God is still speaking. The anointing is still flowing. We are still going into all of the world. But there are some of us who are called to more than where we are right now. And the only thing that is keeping us from tapping into that more is that we haven't come to a place where we have decided that the problems that have irritated us must come to an end that the issues, the trauma, the pain, the depression, it hasn't come to an end yet. And I realized that Jesus knew in this moment that this is not just a job for who I have been for the last 30 years. This is a job for a different version of me. I wanna challenge you watching at home to say that this is an end of an era for that version of who I am. There is a new version of me that is dying to get out. It's been dying to shake the earth. It's been dying to finally be aligned. And I've been waiting for an hour.
but I hear God saying the fact that you even see it as a problem is a sign that the problem is coming to an end. I want to talk to somebody today who was going to make a decision that I don't even need a new year to come. I don't even need a new boo to come. All I need to do is come into a place where I realize that it is an end of an era for a version of me that can no longer exist in the next that God is calling me to. This is a job for a version of me that has been anointed. This is a job for a version of me that has been appointed. This is a job for a version of me that has been in me since I was little, but I didn't have the right environment to break it out. I didn't have the right components to break it out. I didn't have the right team. I hear God saying, you got the right team now. I hear God saying, you got the right vision now. I hear God saying, you got the wisdom. You got the stature. And by God, you got the favor. Are you going to step into it or what? Are you going to be who I've called you to be or what? The kingdom needs some kings. The kingdoms need some princesses. The kingdom needs somebody who will wear a crown. And I want to know is it true or not? Because we got a world to change. We got a devil to chase. We got demons to put in surrender. And if it's you, I want to invite you to a moment, to a moment of transformation. Mm. Mark Twain once said that the two most important days in a person's life is when they're born and when they find out why. If I could add to the eloquent poet saying, I would say that an additional day that is just as important is when you step into your why. The day you're born, the day you find out why, but just because you know doesn't mean you can go. But there is a moment when you step into your why. This message, this word, is somebody's sign that it's time for you to step into your why. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew this was in you. I knew you could handle this. I knew you could carry this. I knew you were anointed for this child. I knew you were anointed for this marriage. I knew you were anointed for that ministry. I knew you were anointed for that church. I knew you were anointed for this. I hear God saying it's time for you to step into it all of the way. This is the end of the era of what was. The end of the era of you shrinking. The end of the era of you no longer believing that you had access. The end of the era of you not believing that you have authority or power. That era is coming to an end. You're gifted. You're gifted. Even now, you're gifted. Even still, there's more in you. I know you've seen a lot. I know you've done a lot, but I hear God saying there's still more, there's still more, there's still more. You're at home, there's tears streaming down your face. There's still more for you. There's still more. This is the end of an era. And I want to pray with you because it takes time. It takes time for an era to end. And it takes courage to believe that just because it's ending doesn't mean that there's not something new beginning. It ended, but there's still life. It ended, but there's still hope. You're dealing with grief, maybe you're, you've lost someone and it feels like I'll never access that essence again. But maybe you'll become that essence. Maybe your marriage, it went through some breakdowns and you think we'll never find that love again. No, maybe we'll find a deeper love than we had before. Yes, it's okay for an era to come to an end. We miss jazz, but we love rock and roll. 
We miss the roaring 20s, but by God, the technology age is something to behold. God says, I can continue to do exceedingly and abundantly, but you have to trust me in the moments where errors have come to an end. You may have not had a choice when your error came to an end, when you lost someone, when you left that job, when you moved to that city, when that marriage ended, you may have not had an option. But you get to choose what you do from here. Hear God saying it's time for you to take your position. And if it's okay, I wanna pray with you. I wanna pray for everyone walking into an ending with faith that something new is beginning. I wanna pray that God would give you, as my husband would say, the gift of goodbye. That you would come to a place where you recognize the only way I can even say hello to who I'm supposed to be, to say hello to my anointing, to walk in the full manifestation of the glory of God that rests on my life as if I say goodbye to what was. And it's gonna take courage but you got this. I wanna pray with you. I wanna pray because I believe God gave me this word with you in mind. And that when he gave me this word that he knew that you would be coming to an end. But I hear God saying, trust what I gave you. If you're at home, I want you to create an altar. Here in this room, let's create an altar. Make my heart an altar, God. What are we putting on that altar? What problem has been plaguing me that I'm gonna place on that altar? I'm putting it on the altar of my heart, God. God, I'm putting it on the altar of my heart because as I put it on the altar of my heart, I'm ready to say goodbye, let it burn, God. Let it burn, let it burn, let it burn. Let it be a sweet smell in your ears, God, in your nose, God. Let it burn, let it burn, let it burn. Because I'm ready to say goodbye to a problem, but I can't do it by myself. I need God's power. I need your anointing. I need your oil. I can't push into this next dimension without you. I don't know how to land this plane unless you teach me how to do it. I don't know how to take off unless you show me how to do it. The end is coming, God, but I can't do it. This is a job for the Holy Ghost. This is a job that only the Holy Spirit can guide me to. God, I don't know how to use what you placed around me. I don't know how to organize it. I don't know how to direct it. I don't know how to raise this child. This is a job that is beyond me. And I hear God saying, it's all right for it to be beyond you because it is not beyond who God is. It is not beyond the knowledge of what God has. It is not beyond the knowledge of who he has called you to be. I hear God saying, you've been trying to do it on your own long enough, that this is a job that only you and I can do together. When Jesus dipped down into that anointing, the glory fell so hard that it kicked off his ministry for the next three years, that God's glory manifested on him. I want to prophesy over you right now, that this problem is going to be the kickstart of God's glory, that it's going to keep rolling in your life, that that glory to glory to glory to glory that you've been missing is about to hit your household like never before. You've been complaining about problem after problem, and I hear God saying, get ready for glory after glory. Get ready for breakthrough after breakthrough. Get ready for innovation. Get ready for creativity. I hear God saying, if you give me the problem, I'll give you the strength strategy. If you give me the problem, I'll give you the glory. If you lay it down at my feet, I'll show you how to pick it up again. I hear God saying, watch the way that I work. I hear God saying, watch the way that I move. And so Father, Father, this problem, we've been trying to accept it as fact, God. Somebody's watching right now and they've been trying to accept this fact that I'm never going to be this and I'm never going to be that. But every time they try to accept it, your spirit rejects it. Your spirit keeps rejecting it, Father. Your spirit keeps rejecting it. And so, Father, I ask that you would bring them into an awareness of what your spirit is trying to teach them. That we don't have to accept this fact, what you have called us to change. 
that we don't have to accept a problem just because the generations before us accepted it. That how else will we break a generational curse unless we decide that I will not accept what the generations before me accepted because I have been called to break it. And so Father, for every household represented, for every person watching whose spirit has been vexed, oh, I come against you, enemy. You've been tormenting them over and over again, making them think that there is no solution to the problem, not recognizing that the problem is the prescription that God is going to use for their debut. I'm going to say that again for someone else watching. The problem is the prescription that God is going to write for your debut, that everything that God has placed down on the inside of you is going to come forth because he wrote this problem out. He said, I'm going to write down a problem that, can on that only they can solve. I'm going to write down a problem that only they can break through. And that problem is going to have to require my glory. And when my problem, their problem and my glory get together, there's going to be a debut that has my evidence all over it. I hear God saying, you're going to carry my DNA because we're going to combine on this problem. And the result is going to be breakthrough and glory like you've never seen before. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on this place. Not just this place, Father, but every place represents presented right now. Father, they're watching from all over the world. They're watching from all over the place, God. And I'm asking that your power would fall like never before. I hear God saying that I got six water pots, but I'm waiting for somebody who's willing to take authority over the emptiness, who's willing to take authority over where there is nothing left. And I hear God saying it is from that place that my glory is going to fall. And it's not just going to fall. It's going to flow, baby, flow, baby, flow. It's going to flow, baby, flow, baby, flow. It's going to be flowing for generations. Your children are going to be talking about this moment. Your great children, great grandchildren are going to be talking about this moment. The moment when my glory fell and flowed through the generations. Father, we make way for you. We have been held back. And some of us, Father, some of us didn't make the best of the time, but we repent. We repent for not growing in wisdom. We repent for not growing in stature and maturity. We repent, Father, for being upset with you for holding us back, for being bitter about being held back. Father, we repent because we made it seem like we were held back so far that you could never redeem us. But as you sent this word, it was evidence, Father, that even those who have been held back can be thrust forward. Father, as we step into the end of who we used to be, that lesser version of who we've called to be, that version of us who doesn't speak up, that version of us who doesn't pursue what you've placed down on the inside of us, Father, that is coming to an end. And we ask, Father, that as we lay that issue that version of us on our altars, that you would show us what you've given us, that your authority would grow, God, let it multiply. God, I can't do it in my own strength. God, I can't do it in my own power. But God, if I had your spirit, God, God, give them your spirit, God. Show them how to use what you've given them, God, by the spirit, God. Don't let their mama speak into it. Don't let their grandfather speak into it. Let them echo what the spirit is already saying down on the inside of them. I don't want to manufacture what you've already done. I want to do something by the spirit, God. Let it be done by the spirit in their households, in their families families, in their businesses, in their finances. God, do it by the Spirit. God, I'm praying that you would give them strategy, that you would show them how to use what is already within their reach. I come against the spirit of stuck. I come against the spirit of frustration. I come against the spirit of I'm never going to get out of this. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. You're not here to be stuck. You are not lost. You are not without hope. It's already here. Ah, Shakara, it's already here. Everything you need is already in reach. 
Everything you need has already been anointed to produce a miracle. It's already here. You already got access to it. It's already here. God, show them how to use what you already gave them. I'm not praying for you to do anything else. God, show me how to use what you already gave me. And as I use it, God, don't let me use it and not have faith in it. Don't let me use it and not trust it. Don't let me use it and not believe that it's potent. Let me use it from a place of confidence, from a place of trust. God, wherever there's going to be a release, wherever there's going to be a fresh start, Father, I pray that they wouldn't do it afraid. Sometimes we have to do it afraid. Not this time. Let your peace fall when your power comes. Let your trust comes when your power falls. Everything that your presence carries, joy unspeakable, let that, let that fall when your power falls, Father. And as we receive this word, God, I pray that it would take root and that it would produce fruit the kind of fruit that feeds our children for generations after this. There are some endings that are okay, tough, but okay. God, let this be an end that we thank you for because it marked the fresh beginning of who we are in you. We receive it, Father. We hold it close to our soul and we say we'll never let it go. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. I believe that this may be one of those words that you want to chew on for a little bit. And so I want to make sure that you stay plugged in, not just for this word, but for the sound that is being released for your spirit right now. Create an environment for this word to continue to flourish. This word is but a seed. The environment is what you do with after this word. Let this word continue to have an environment. And if you're like me and this word is something that you feel like this is for sure something that I need to have in my atmosphere. As a matter of fact, I want to sow a seed. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to sow a $600 seed, six water pots. I'm going to take $600 and I'm going to sow it into this moment. For you, it may not be $600. It could be $6. It could be $60,000. It could be $6 million. We don't know what God has placed on your heart, but I want to give you an opportunity to show God that I didn't just receive this word. I'm going to step into this word. I'm going to step into this word and I'm going to let it cost me something. And in the process of letting it cost me something, Father, I want there to be a harvest right here. I love sowing after a word because for me, it's my way of marking the spot. God, this is what you told me. God, this is what you spoke. And so on whatever level that is, whatever you already have within your reach, take your six water pots and offer it up to God so that he can fill it and so that you can distribute what he feels. There are directions on the screen. I want you to be a part of this moment by any means necessary. And I just want to pray over that whatever it is you decided to give. I'm praying that you can match me in that $600, but six on any level is what we're gonna sow into this word. Father, I thank you that you're gonna give us divine instruction on the water pots you've given us. That the areas of our life that look empty, that look like nothing could be poured into them, that all of our hope is gone, all of our faith is gone, Father, that you're gonna fill it. And that you're going to fill it with something that seems so basic, just water you used in those pots. And yet that water turned into wine. And so, Father, we offer you this seed, Father, because this word is for us. But we also know that it is to come through us. And so whatever it is that you're going to pull through us, Father, we want you to know that we come into agreement with it. Receive this seed, Father. Receive this offering as a sign that we heard you. We trust you. We believe you. And we're going to step into this moment. We're going to step into our why with full confidence that we won't do it on our own. In Jesus' name, amen, family. I love you. I love you so, so much. And I can't wait to come and stalk you all again soon.